All right, Paul, we are back to wow the audience with some more great <laughs> knowledge that we have recently that we have recently learned. Can you tell them what are we going to talk about today? We're doing great. Um, so we, we're going to be discussing <laughs> our, our episode 281, where we discussed hypercalcemia with the wildly enthusiastic and incredibly smart and eloquent Dr. Carl Pillay, who talked to us all about the the initial evaluation and workup and management. Um, Mostly the, the evaluation, but uh, of hypercalcemia. And there was just there were so many great pearls in this episode. I don't know, Matt. Where do you want to start? Yeah, uh, super producer Dr. Nora Toronto made some great figures to go along with this one, which uh, certainly we can we can uh, link to for the audience. But the when you when you see hypercalcemia, yeah, the history. I think most of us are probably familiar with it. You got to ask about some medications. Lithium is one of the ones that you might not think of right off the bat uh, in primary care. Uh, it's not, I don't see it around as much anymore, but there's patients out there on lithium. So ask about lithium, be mindful of thiazide diuretics, uh, ask them how much calcium and vitamin D they're taking. And he made a point, Paul, I, I don't know that I've caught this, but maybe now I will now that I'm kind of looking out for it. He's, he said he had seen a lot of the times where patients, people accidentally ordered calcitriol for patients when they were trying to just order vitamin D supplement for their patient. And uh, so, so look out for that one. And, uh, and then if a patient does have some mild hypercalcemia on their labs, you got to think, is this person just a little bit dehydrated? So you could do the Paul Williams method, Paul. You'll be happy to know, which is? Happy. Just repeat the lab. Just repeat right. it. Just do it again. Yeah. Just keep checking until you like the answer. <laughs> Okay. And with that repeat calcium, depending on your suspicion, you might want to check albumin so you can correct the calcium, uh, their creatinine, uh, a PTH. You can check a phosphorus level, and you can check a 25-OH vitamin D to start off. Um, the, I, the I calcium, the ionized calcium, really not as helpful in the outpatient setting. He made the point that when you collect that, it really has to be collected in a certain way and processed quickly. And that's realistically just not going to happen in the outpatient setting. So, and Paul, I don't know if you thought about this, but did you have like a good framework, uh, PTH dependent versus independent that this, that our guest had? I, I hadn't really heard of it that way before. I, I feel like I'd heard of it that way. I'd not heard it explained so eloquently before. So I think he really solidified a, a framework that I had just sort of previously been vaguely aware of but hadn't actually followed my own brain. So I, I found this extraordinarily helpful. He separated it into if someone has a inappropriately normal or a high PTH, then you should consider the hypercalcemia to be PTH dependent. Causes of that, the biggest one's going to be primary hyperpara, which we're going to talk about a, a bit later in the video. And then... Uh, you can think about FHH. Li uh, lithium can cause uh, a PTH-dependent rise in calcium. So for these people, um, you can. We're going to go through the workup of that a little bit later. And then for low PTH, if the calcium's high and the PTH is low, you can think about: Is this a malignancy? Is this person taking just mega doses of calcium, vitamin D, um, or do they have some sort of like granulomatous disease or some disease that's eroding the bone? Uh, PTHRP is also one of the ones to consider. Paul, in primary care, we use a lot of thiazide diuretics, and we see a lot of this mild hypercalcemia. I shouldn't worry about that, right? That's that's nothing. It's well, I mean, I, I'm not going to say that that was my mindset before this episode. I, again, <laughs> trying to avoid self-incrimination, but I, but I will say, yeah, it's I, I remember. You know, I'd say I'd feel like a smart person because I thought, well, I know thiazides can increase calcium reabsorption, so that's probably the cause. And if you stop the thiazide and it gets better, then you can feel great about that, like you're a genius. But one of the things that was talked about in the episode is that really you have these homeostatic mechanisms in place to prevent hypercalcemia from happening. So you shouldn't really be able to overcome them, even with the thiazide diuretic necessarily. So even though you may have fixed the number initially, the fact that it happened in the first place might be an indicator that there was some underlying primary hyperparathyroidism that you should probably be cognizant of because I, I think you pointed out um, in the episode you you would expect the PTH to actually be suppressed if someone's hypercalcemic and it was caused by this this reabsorption so if it's if it's normal uh, or, or sort of the higher end of normal that's that's a little bit off and so you should probably just kind of keep your antenna um, up just to make sure that you're not missing also underlying primary hyperparathyroidism if I understand things mechanistically and he it, he made the point if you try a withdrawal of the diuretic um, and the the PTH actually might go up, you know, if you if you take away what's causing the mild hypercalcemia, maybe the calcium comes down a little bit, but then the PTH might go back up again. So 
it, it might be worth running that experiment to see if there really is an underlying primary hyperparathyroidism, which he said is pretty common. It's like one in 100 patients. It's like 1% of the population, something like that, he said. So it's it's pretty common. Yeah, very really um, prevalent. What, so with asymptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism, let's say we find one of these people, what do we have to look out for? I know this is like always on boards, but it's also super practical. Who do we need to send for surgery? Yeah, it's... I feel like it's one of those things I had to look up every single time. Like I, I knew there were indications for it, but I always had to sort of resource them. But happily, they're they're out there for us as who we should send off for for possible surgical intervention. So the ones to bear in mind is age less than fifty. The idea being is that there's probably some cost benefit there. So rather than just tracking this in perpetuity and making sure it doesn't cause problems and doing serial labs and sort of agonizing over the the evaluation of it, these are patients for whom a little bit more aggressive intervention might actually be warranted, and you might also be prolonging bone health by doing so. Um, other indications if you have significant hypercalcemia and by that a calcium level greater than one milligram per deciliter above the upper limit of normal that is probably an indication for parathyroid removal uh, another one that we talked about is underlying renal dysfunction because because renal dysfunction already predisposes you to bone mineral disease and then you have this synergistic badness of primary hyperparathyroidism again to preserve bone health it's probably worthwhile to consider surgery for these patients right uh, also kidney stones or someone who's at a high risk of kidney stones and so when you're thinking about that, one of the things they even recommend is doing imaging to rule out either the presence of kidney stones or even the, the presence of nephrocalcinosis. So if you see that on, on any kind of imaging, that would be an indication for parathyroid removal as well. Yeah, and, and this last, is, oh, that, go ahead. Paul, is yeah. that one that you were, I, I just want to dig into that one a little bit. Were you, I wasn't really doing the, too much of this renal imaging. Uh, that, that was news to me. I know the guidelines are old, but it, it's not like I see a ton of cases like this. But now I feel like, of course, since we've had this show, I've, I've been talking in residence clinic, a b bunch of cases about this. And uh, the imaging thing is something that I just hadn't been on my ra radar. And also the urine studies, which also he talked about. Is that something that you're going to be doing now? Yeah, I'll be I'll be much more aggressive with it. I think I think you know, historically I would at least sort of check for a history of kidney stones um, or anything that even sort of smelled like kidney stones to sort of help do the the risk benefit analysis. But it's probably better to just to be more aggressive in the workup just to make sure you're not missing anything. So I think any of the imaging modalities that we discussed, which I think include, I think even plain film imaging is in there just to look for the nephrocalcinosis or seeing calcified stones or yeah. ultrasound or CT scan are all um, reasonable options. Right. Yeah. And then the, the urine studies, which I, I read a little bit more about afterwards, he, he, if, if they have high levels of calcium in the urine, that may be predisposing them to stones. And you could send a, 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 a stone risk profile. There's a bunch of these big panels that are available. He said he actually just sends that right off the bat because it's just much more convenient for the patient. They don't have to do multiple collections. They just do one collection. It, it gives them their risk for stone formation, and then you can use that to make a decision. If they're really high risk for stones, then maybe you would treat them earlier than later. Um, you know that, but per the guidelines, that would be a reasonable uh, time to treat them. And then finally, Paul, you you were I think you were getting on to the osteoporosis and fragility fractures. So, what what was the what was the deal there? Yeah, and it's I, I mean part of it's what you'd expect. So you would you would consider DEXA scanning to evaluate for osteoporosis, and that would be an indication for a possible indication for a role of surgery. But then you, you guys also spent some time talking about this specific um, imaging modality, this vertebral fracture analysis, which was not part of my sort of routine practice. Um, oh, mine either. Part, where I think looking specifically for the the compression fractures that, that by and large are asymptomatic and, and not necessarily um, seen on all DEXA scans. So I think these actually look at the, the thoracolumbar spine specifically for compression fractures, just to make sure that you're not missing underlying osteoporosis, if I understand correctly. Is that right, Matt? Yeah, and since the show, I've actually had the occasion to order this, and uh, sure enough, he was right. A lot of the modern DEXA <laughs> scanners Great. do offer, you can order DEXA of the axial skeleton with a VFA, vertebral fracture analysis, and that, that order was in the electronic medical record for me, so it was super easy to order it, and uh, we'll see what the outcome is, but uh, that is something that we should be doing. It's it's in the guidelines, and uh, uh it's something that was completely practice changing to me. So we've gone through a ton on this video, but the episode was even more packed. So check out our interview with Dr. Carl Pillay. You can click on the link in the transcript below. And thank you for watching. Bye.